Hi again and welcome to our Front Range Spring Gardening Series. Thanks so much for joining us on behalf of CSU Extension. Really glad that you're here. Remember that we are doing this series over the course of nine weeks. This is week number two, so there's lots of fun education headed your way every Friday at noon. Uh, my name is Allison O'Connor. I am the horticulture agent in Larimer County and with Carol O'Mara in Boulder County will be your pilot today, uh, helping answer questions and providing information to Lisa. So thanks to Carol. And our presenter today is Lisa Mason. She's the horticulture agent in Arapahoe County. She's an entomologist. She's extremely knowledgeable about many things. And she's going to talk to you, to, you today about friends and foes in the insect world in gardens. So thank you, Lisa. Take it away. All right, thanks everybody for having me today um, and for the introduction, Allison. Uh, for today's webinar, just a few housekeeping things. Um, we do have cameras and audio turned off to uh, eliminate distractions. If you have any clarifying questions, please put them in the chat box. Those questions will go to the host and I'll stop about halfway through um, depending on the time and we'll answer a couple questions then and then we can also take more questions um, at the end of the presentation. Now, insects, garden insects is a huge topic, so I'm, I won't be able to cover all of them. If you have a question or we don't cover an insect you're interested in, feel free to send me an email or you can also reach out to your local county extension agent. Uh, we are recording this class and it will be posted, give us a few days, um, but it will be posted on the cohorts blog website. And also um, to eliminate distractions, uh, we will not be able to save the chat um, from this webinar either. So let's get started. Uh, today we're gonna talk about garden insects, friends and foes. Now friends and foes is a matter of opinion. Uh, for instance, you might think an aphid is an, a nuisance and a foe in your garden, but that hungry ladybug may beg to differ. So today when I talk about insects, I'll talk about it from a human perspective, but also an ecosystem perspective on uh, the friend or foe concept. Uh, we are Colorado State University Extension. Uh, we are uh, present in almost every county and our job is to bring science to the community. So if you haven't been in touch with your local extension office, I highly encourage you to get to know us and learn about the services we offer in your, in your county. Uh, in terms of horticultural services, we do diagnostics. Um, if you have a sick tree or your lawn is struggling or you have a, a strange insect in your garden, you can contact us uh, for assistance. We also do programs and classes like this. And in some cases, we can also do on-site consultations. So let's get started. So insects, it's such a broad topic, uh, but the why do we need insects? Why are they in our ecosystems? Well, the short answer is we can't live without them. Um, and our ecosystems can't survive without insects. They play a vital role in nearly every ecosystem. Now, most people I think probably assume pollinators is one reason why we, we can't survive without insects because pollinators uh, pollinate our food and provide us our fruits and our vegetables and other nutritious, uh, nutritious food sources. Uh, but it goes beyond just pollinators and why we need insects. So a few other reasons, uh, decomposers. Insects are our cleanup crew. And a great example, a visual example for you is uh, we have a lot of species of beetles that will decompose manure. And so if we didn't have dung beetles, for instance, we would still have bison patties from when bison roamed the West, you know, a long time ago. Uh, so they really, really uh, provide cleanup services for us. Insects are also predators. So our summers would be overrun with caterpillars and aphids if we didn't have predators feeding on some of those uh, pest insects. And insects also, uh, provide are their natural enemies uh, for other insects. And in many countries around the world, insects are also a food source. Not so much here in the United States, but insects provide a lot of protein and are a vital food source for, for humans, but also for um, animals and other insects and uh, wildlife in the ecosystem. 
And then insects also provide us with some products like honey and silk are a couple of common examples. So let's look closer at some of the insects we find in our garden. So these are gonna be our garden friends and we can categorize these beneficial insects into three categories. So we have predators, parasites, and pollinators. And it's important to note that, you know, most people assume insects are gonna be a nuisance or a pest, but in all reality, vast majority of them are harmless to people and plants. It's only a small number of species that are a nuisance and cause harm that really kind of give insects a bad reputation sometimes, but the vast majority are completely harmless and play a role in our ecosystem. So let's look at predators. So predators, a great example is a ladybug uh, or lacewings. They're actively gonna search and hunt and prey on other insects such as soft bodied insects like caterpillars and aphids. We also have parasite insects and this fly is a great example, a great benefit because she is going to seek out pest insects and she's going to lay an egg on that pest insect and that fly larva will, that parasite larva will feed on the pest insect. Um, Tachinid flies and wasps are a great example of uh, parasite insects that provide benefits in our gardens. And then of course we have our pollinators. So bees, butterflies, uh, some species of flies, beetles, uh, and they help facilitate plant reproduction uh, for a wide variety of plants that provide us benefits. So let's talk about one of the most famous beneficial insects, and that is ladybugs. I always have to include ladybugs because the, they feed on aphids, but the, the stage of their life where they eat the most aphids is in the larval stage. And most people don't recognize this is the larva of a ladybug. I kind of think it looks like a little dragon almost. So when you see these people, I think sometimes assume, oh, it's a pest, um, it looks scary, you know, but really this is a baby ladybug and a single lady beetle can feed on up to 5,000 aphids. So we need all the, the lady beetles we can get. Uh, we have a variety of species that are found here in Colorado. Um, and you can also purchase ladybugs at the garden store if you have aphid infestations. But I do have to caution you about that because ladybugs, the adults ladybugs, can fly. And so when the lady beetles fly, um, they may leave your garden. And so purchasing ladybugs, um, most often it's a native species. It's not going to do any harm, but it may not be the most effective control method either. And I, I use ladybug and lady beetle kind of interchangeably. Lady beetle is uh, the, the official common name. Lace wings are another great uh, beneficial predator we have in our gardens. And so most people, again, are familiar with the adult version of the lace wing. But here's what the larva looks like. So, so it almost has that dragon-like appearance too. And they have these pinchers at the end. So it, it might look a little scary if you come across it. But in fact, these lace wings are ferocious predators and they use those pinchers to, to catch caterpillars and even many times the size of the, the lace wing larva. So they're ferocious predators and a great addition to our gardens. Uh, you can also purchase green, green lace wing eggs for your garden. And here, this bottom picture shows you what the, what the eggs look like. Uh, they're, they're very neat looking. Uh, generally, lace wings, if you purchase them, they can be a little more effective because you're purchasing them as uh, either eggs or larva, and so they can't fly right away. Uh, so they're more likely, they're going to stick around in your garden maybe a little bit longer until they become adults. Serpid flies. Now, serpid flies are a group of flower visiting flies, and they often look like wasps. They look like wasps, they, they're, they're very smart. So they evolved to look like wasps because wasps are stinging insects. And if they look like a stinging insect, predators will avoid them. It's, it's a, something called mimicry. And so they, they, look, they also look like bees too, bees and wasps. 
So they, they might look a little scary, but look closely. They've got these giant fly eyes and very short and stubby antenna. Those are two characteristics that will tell you it's a fly and not a bee or a wasp. Again, completely harmless, um, but very beneficial for our garden for two reasons. One, they can be pollinators because they do visit flowers. And two, they are also in the larval stage they are voracious predators of aphids. Uh, serpent fly larvae are, are often very hard to see. They, they're pretty elusive, but they're there. You're more likely to see the adult flies visiting your garden. Uh, one study out of Cornell showed that serpent flies can reduce the aphid population up to 70 to 100%, and larvae can feed on up to 400 uh, soft-bodied insects a day. So they're great insects for our garden. Um, if you want to encourage them, if you have an aphid infestation, that's, that's one way. But also providing nectar plants is great. Praying mantis uh, or mantids. This is a group of insects. We have seven species in Colorado. Five of them are native, two of them are introduced. The most common one we are familiar with is an introduced species like this picture, uh, and they are outstanding hunters. Um, they have some hunting capabilities that other insects don't have, like their eyes, and they can move or they can move their head around more so than other insects. They also their their forelegs are great for catching and grasping prey. Uh, so so they're pretty wild hunters. Now, friend or foe, most people would probably say they're friends. Uh, some people might say they're foes because they, they are opportunistic hunters. So they, they will hunt pest insects, but sometimes they're also gonna hunt beneficial insects. It all depends on what they can most easily catch. And in some instances, they've actually been known to catch and hunt hummingbirds. Like they'll, they'll stick around at a hummingbird feeder and they can actually take out a hummingbird. Uh, now that's rare, but there, there's many documented cases where, you know, photos of that occurring. So friend or foe, you can decide. Um, praying mantis are a fun insect to introduce to, to kids uh, when they're learning about insects just because they, they are so unique. Uh, they, they can provide biological control. Again, you can purchase Chinese mantid egg cases at the garden center. Not going to be the most effective form of biological control because they're very mobile. They can move around. And I have a picture of their egg case right here uh, to show you. Oftentimes, the females will lay their egg case uh, in the fall. And sometimes it's on buildings or patio furniture or on fences. It can be in odd locations and, and most people might not know what it is, but this is what a praying mantis egg case looks like. Okay, to kinid flies. So these are gonna be sometimes larger flies that you may observe in your garden. Um, again, like we talked about with serpent flies, they've got big fly eyes and short little antenna. Now, a lot of to kinid flies have long hairs on their body. Uh, which sometimes can be an identification characteristic. We love our tachinid flies because like I mentioned before, the, the female fly will find a host, a pest insect, and she, she will pierce the, that host insect to lay her egg. And then her egg will, when it hatches, it will feed on that pest larva. Um, so very beneficial, and uh, you'll oftentimes see the adults feeding on nectar flowers. Okay, so we talked about uh, predators and parasites, and we're about to talk about pollinators, but I have to throw in one because we get a lot of questions about this. Um, this is a decomposer, and it's called the bumble flower beetle. And you will find bumble flower beetles in composting piles or decaying matter or manure or a, a rotting stump. And they have, the, the larval form has these C-shaped grubs, which look similar to Japanese beetle grubs. Um, and actually the adults can sometimes be confused with Japanese beetles too. Now their life cycle is very different from Japanese beetles. So bumble flower beetles feed on de decomposing matter. They do not 
They do not nest in turf grass. So if you find these little C-shaped grubs in, in a compost pile or in a dead log, um, don't worry at all. In fact, you can leave them there because they're just feeding on the decaying matter. They will not harm your turf grass at all. So, and oftentimes you will find the adults visiting flowers no worries, they are not feed, they're feeding on the nectar, not very unlike Japanese beetle that will feed on the actual plant. So another, another common beneficial insect in our gardens. So if you wanna attract more beneficials uh, like these predators and parasites, uh, planting flowers that have nectar is one of the best things you can do. So I listed some examples. Um, this photo here is moon carrot. Moon carrot is a, a plant select plant uh, that you can find at some local garden centers. And it's very, it has a unique look to it. It will attract all kinds of beneficial insects, um, wasps, bees, flies, uh, all kinds of great insects that can um, add value to your garden. So moon carrot is one of my favorites, but there are a lot of excellent options out there. So let's talk briefly about pollinators. So pollinators facilitate plant reproduction because they transfer pollen from one flower to another. And pollinators are very important for many of our, our food crops, about 87 crops. And that translates to about one in every three bites of food. Uh, and that's mostly our nutritious fruits, veggies, and nuts. Uh, that, that uh, bees will pollinate and other pollinators will pollinate. Uh, but it goes beyond just our fruits and veggies because uh, bees will pollinate alfalfa and clover and alfalfa and clover are often used as cattle food. Uh, so then you get into our meat and dairy industries. So pollinators really add a lot of benefits and the honeybee is a very efficient pollinator for many crops. But in addition, we have a lot of other bees too uh, and other pollinators that are critical to pollination. Um, bumblebees is a great example because they will buzz pollinate plants. So they have a very special vibration. When they land on a flower, the, the vibration releases the pollen that can then be transferred to another plant. So oftentimes um, plants in the Solanaceae family are nightshades, tomatoes and peppers. Um, they are buzz pollinated by bumblebees. And squash bees are another great example. Um, they are a specialist of pumpkins and squash. So if you grow pumpkins and squash, um, go out in the early morning and look in the bright, big, bright yellow flowers like this photo here and look for the squash bees. So with, for our bees, uh, we have over 900 species in Colorado. The honeybee is only one of those species. And the honeybee is actually a managed insect. Um, it is not at risk of going extinct because we breed the honeybee and we keep bees. Uh, the other over 900 species are, are mostly native to, to our gardens and our ecosystems. Of all of those bees, 70% of them nest underground and 30% nest in cavities. So when we think about our gardens and that most of our bees nest underground, we can leave bare soil areas uh, because that they need those habitat spaces to nest. Uh, you can also provide cavities, maybe a bee hotel or a dead log uh, for other nesting bees. Uh, reduced mulching. Now mulch has many benefits to the landscape. So I'm, I'm certainly advocating for mulching, but maybe in some areas, if you would like to provide bee habitat, limit the thickness of the mulch and maybe even leave some areas of bare soil for those ground nesting bees. And then reducing lawn area too. Poll bees, pollinators, other beneficial insects, they rely on flowers. So if you can provide flowers um, or if you have areas of turf grass that you aren't using, uh, that can be a great option. Turf is a wonderful option for your landscape. So it all really depends on the, your, your goals of your yard, garden, and landscape. And so I want to show you a variety, the variety we have of bees here in Colorado. So this top left-hand corner, this little bee, she is on a bindweed flower. So she's very tiny, all the way up to like our bumblebees and, and this sunflower bee right here, uh, they can be upwards of one inch. So they're all sizes, shapes, 
and colors. You know, here, here's one um, has red. Uh, we have our green metallic sweat bees. Uh, we really have quite a variety in Colorado. This photo in the top right is a leaf cutter bee. Now leaf cutter bees are often visible because sometimes if you have big green leaves, they're gonna cut out a perfectly circle shaped hole out of that plant. Not to worry, it does not harm your plant at all. Um, she will take those leaf pieces and take it back to her, her cavity nest um, so she can lay eggs there. If you're observing insects in your garden, look how bees carry pollen. That's a great way to determine a bee versus another insect is some are gonna carry pollen on their legs, some are gonna carry pollen on the underside of their abdomen. And bee hotels, bee hotels are a great addition to your backyard. Uh, I will recommend doing a lot of research. Um, there's several great extension fact sheets out there. Um, here's one from Michigan that kind of has the do's and don'ts because if you don't install a bee hotel correctly or the tubes are too short, um, you're, you're not gonna help the bees at all. So read over the fact sheets and that'll give you the parameters of, of how to um, provide a, a helpful bee hotel. Okay, another group of pollinators are butterflies. Um, these are some of the most common um, loved insects that I think we all see. If you are interested, um, Colorado has over 250 species of butterflies. So, and if you wanna attract more butterflies to your landscape, plant the caterpillar host plant. Um, CSU Extension has a great fact sheet with a table that outlines which species and which uh, plants the caterpillars need and which plants the adults need. So I'm gonna walk through a couple of examples here. Um, monarch butterflies is a very common, common one we see in Colorado. We are not along the migratory path of the monarch. So we don't see as many as like the Midwest, but we do see them. Um, if you wanna attract monarch butterflies, plant milkweed. These bottom two photos here, this is a two-tailed swallowtail. So especially along the, the front range, this is the most common big yellow butterfly that we see. Now the caterpillar of the two-tailed butterfly hosts on ash trees and choke cherry. So if you're familiar with emerald ash borer at all, uh, you will know, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, you know that uh, our ash tree population is going to be declining or is declining depending on where you live. And we're losing a lot of our ash trees. So this means two-tailed swallowtails need choke cherries. And choke cherry, it's a great native shrub. It's a low water shrub that you can add to your landscape that can provide um, a host as, can, can, oh, excuse me, can be a host plant for two-tailed swallowtails. So each butterfly has its own unique um, ho caterpillar host plant. Now, sometimes butterflies can be considered a nuisance. Uh, for example, the black swallowtail will feed on dill and fennel, which sometimes you know, we grow that um, because we want, to, we want to eat it. So sometimes it can be considered a nuisance. So it all depends on the, the goals of your landscape. You want to attract butterflies? The host plants and nectar plants are great. Uh, butterflies need a combination of sunny areas and sheltered areas. Uh, so different shrubs and trees where, where they can rest. And then also like all pollinators, they do need a water source. So here's an example of a, a friend or a foe, you decide. Uh, this is the variegated fritillary butterfly. Uh, the host caterpillar food happens to be pansies and petunias which you know, a lot of us spend a lot of money on those plants in our gardens. So this is a story of last year, I had a client call the extension office saying, I have these caterpillars feeding on my petunias, what do I do? And he sent me pictures and I, I knew they were variegated fertility. So I asked if I could have them and I, I gave them their own pansy plants and I reared them. Uh, they had a, have a beautiful metallic colored cocoon. Um, and when they hatched into butterflies, I then released them. So if you have children, this is a, or, or you're just a curious adult, this is a great activity to do. Um, I didn't mind sacrificing some of my pansies for the butterflies. Um, but if you, if you find these critters next year, um, know that, that 
maybe they're the variegate, variegated fritillary butterfly. We also have a variety of other pollinators that I don't have time to get into today, but I did want to acknowledge them. So hummingbirds are a great pollinator and you can see this little female hummingbird. She's got pollen on the top of her head there. They're going to be attracted to red or an orange flowers. Um, and those flowers need to be long and tubular so they can get their tongue inside those flowers uh, for the nectar. Um, you can also put out um, hummingbird feeders to attract them. So we have four species that we commonly see along the front range, um, but we definitely have other species in Colorado as well. Now wasps, wasps, I'm going to touch on wasps here in a minute. Wasps are often, they will visit flowers for nectar. Most of the time they are not pollinators, but we do have exceptions. These, the wasps in this picture are a specialized wasps that actually feed on pollen. These feed on pollen. Wasps are typically predators and carnivores that feed on insects, but this is a pollen wasp and they pollinate penstemon flowers. So there's exceptions to every rule. Um, flies, flies, uh, flower visiting flies can be pollinators. We touched on butterflies. Uh, we also have some species of beetles and especially in the late summer when we have rabbit brush and goldenrod and some of our other late blooming flowers, um, beetles can pollinate those plants. We also have certain species of moths. So in this picture here is a white lined sphinx moth. This is one of my favorites. Uh, it is closely related to the tomato hornworm, but it does not harm your tomato plants at all. Uh, in fact, it hosts on other plants. So the white line sphinx moth can often be seen visiting white flowers in the early evenings that have long spurs on their petals. And bats. So bats are also pollinators. Here in Colorado, we have 18 species. Uh, they are primarily insect feeders. So they feed on mosquitoes and, and other things. Uh, but if you go south, uh, bats pollinate the agave plant, which gives us tequila. So if you appreciate a good margarita, um, you can thank the bats for that. Okay, if you're interested in attracting more pollinators or beneficial insects, here are two great books uh, that talk about habitats and host food and all that kinds of, all that good stuff. And if you're specifically interested in bees, this is my favorite book on native bees. And then I also run a citizen science project on observing native bees in, in your own landscape. So if you're interested in that, um, please send me an email. There is a field guide available on the Extension website that you can download to learn more about the native bees in your landscape. Okay, so now um, I'm gonna take one question. Do we have one question? I do have a question that came in, Lisa, if you don't mind answering it. Okay. So if someone who has a greenhouse and they seem to have some of the high pressure insects like aphids or other things, if they were to introduce predatory insects to help with those populations, what would be the balance? Would those predators stick around if there's not a food source or would they tend to leave? So in a, in a greenhouse setting, that's going to be an enclosed setting. So um they may not have the ability to leave. You know, I in a greenhouse setting, I would have to do a little bit of research on biocontrol efforts for things like aphids in a greenhouse. Um, send me an email. Um, Allison, if you could put my email in the chat box too, I'd be happy to answer that. Uh, I'm more familiar with insects that are out and, you know, in, in the garden and not necessarily a greenhouse, but I can certainly find the answer for you. I will do that. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, we will keep going. So this next session section is, again, friend or foe. It depends on who you ask. So let's start with, we're going to start with wasps and stinging insects. So let's dispel some of the, the misinformation about stings. Uh, if you get stung, 90% or more of the time, it is caused by the Western yellow jacket, which is this insect in the top right-hand corner. Honeybees can certainly sting if they are provoked, um, especially by their hive or if they are stepped on. Wasps can sting you multiple times and AM can be more aggressive where honeybees can only sting you once. Now a honeybee doesn't want to sting you because the honeybee will actually die after it stings you. Uh, so they really use stinging as a last resort. 
um, where wasps um, can sting you multiple times. Now, in terms of our native bees and our solitary wasps, which I'm gonna talk more about solitary wasps, um, they either cannot sting or very, very rarely sting. Like, like a, a mason bee, for instance, you would have to pick up a mason bee and probably squeeze it for it to sting you. So most native bees and solitary wasps, you know, it would have to be accidentally pressed up against your skin or anything. They're certainly not aggressive and really don't even know that um, people are around them. So when you think about um, planting flowers and if you're interested in pollinator habitats, really um, adding those plants are, are a very low risk for stings since the stings since the vast majority of stings are caused by the Western yellow jacket. So let's talk about the Western yellow jacket because this is a nuisance, I think, for, for many people during the summer season and the gardening season. So when we think about wasps as a whole, wasps are one of the most diverse groups of insects in our world. And many of them have a fascinating biology. Wasps get a bad reputation for two species. You know, even though there's thousands of others, two species become a nuisance and can be considered a foe. And the first one is the Western yellow jacket. So if you have insects flying around your barbecue, you're eating dinner outside, um, you have trash cans outside, those insects guaranteed, those are gonna be Western yellow jackets. And that is because they are scavengers. So most wasps are hunters and they will hunt like caterpillars. Western yellow jackets are scavengers and they're looking for, for meat and or sugary sodas. They're looking for food. So uh, the best thing you can do, um, and since they are the most aggressive, aggressive wasp that species that we have, um, one of the best things you can do is if you know you have yellow jackets, you can place yellow wasp traps out early in the season, like any time now, actually, because wasps have a, a one year life cycle. So the, the last year, the female built her colony, the queen built her colony. She had up to several hundred individuals and once fall and winter, once those cold temperatures arrived, that colony died. And so the only, the only individuals left are the new hibernating queens. So the new hibernating queens are among the first insects to emerge in the spring. And if you put out a yellow, uh, yellow jacket trap, you can sometimes catch those queens before she builds a colony. Now, the other thing to note is Western yellow jackets nest underground. So this is different than the paper wasps that I'm gonna talk about next, but yellow jacket nests are hard to find and which makes them hard to control too. So if you happen to find a yellow jacket nest, be very, very careful because yellow jackets can be very aggressive and they will defend their nest. Um, if you happen to have a yellow jacket that is very close to your house and it's, it's too, close for, um, too close for comforts, uh, we, we really recommend hiring a professional because if you put, for instance, if you put wasp spray in an underground nest, that's not gonna be very effective. Their nest is very well protected underground. So really for underground yellow jacket nests that are a problem, consider hiring a professional because it can be dangerous. Now, now we're gonna contrast that to the European paper wasp. So remember I said the yellow jacket, they're, they're the aggressive ones. They're the ones that um, can sting you over and over, you know, if they feel threatened. The European paper wasp, they actually don't want to sting you. They kind of do their own thing. The only exception is if they feel like their nest is really threatened. And so they built these papery nests uh, in our sheds, in, under our house eaves, or in any dark location. So if you find a paper wasp nest, if it is not near uh, human activity, you could probably just leave it. Um, it's not gonna do anyone any harm and that colony is only gonna last the season. Um, they don't return to the nest each year. But if you've got a, 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 a ooh, sorry, a paper wasp nest that's a little too close for comfort and you know, it's just too close to human activity, um, there are things you can do like wasp sprays and, and other um, nest removal techniques. Um, Keep in mind the yellow jacket traps do not work on paper wasps. They only work on yellow jackets. 
So keep that in mind. If you have questions about this, um, please contact your local extension agents. Um, European paper wasps, they, they do, they feed on caterpillars and pest insects. So they do provide valuable pest control. They are an invasive species. So they, they are not supposed to be here. And sometimes they do feed on butterfly larva too. So it all depends on how you think about it. So my recommendation would be, if it's out of the way, you can leave it. If it's too close to human activity, consider removing it. Now, so those are our two nuisance species. So we can call them foes, but let's talk about our wasps that are friends. And that is our solitary wasps. This is a fascinating group of insects that are here in our backyards. And most of the time we don't even know that they are there. So we have this large group of diverse insects and they, they provide us valuable pest control services. And most of the time we just don't even see them. Um, here's some examples. So this is a sand wasp in the top right hand corner. They nest in sand areas and they feed on pest insects. Um, oftentimes you can see the adults feeding on nectar flowers. Uh, in the bottom left hand corner here, this is another common species. Um, it is a black and yellow mud dauber. So these wasps will actually hunt spiders and they make mud nests. Occasionally you might find them on a building or a house, um, but they make mud nests and they will, each female provision six to 15 spiders in each nest cell for her baby wasp. So um, again, this, these wasps, they really don't wanna sting you. They don't really care about people. Um, the only way they would could potentially sting you is if um, you stepped on one, for instance. In the top left-hand corner, this is a cuckoo wasp. So this is a, a brilliant emerald green wasp that actually parasitizes other solitary wasps. So sometimes you'll see these, these wasps around bee hotels because sometimes solitary wasps will nest in a bee hotel and this cuckoo wasp is looking for a solitary wasp um, species. She will lay her eggs inside the nest and her, her eggs, her larva will outcompete the host wasp nest. So they don't bother us um, and provide us valuable services. So what happens if you have bees, or I'm sorry, if you have wasps in your bee hotel? You know, that's actually pretty cool. Um, it's, it's, a cool it's cool to observe because these wasps, again, aren't gonna hurt you. They are not a nuisance. They are not our yellow jackets or our paper wasps. So you can watch them up close. You might see an, an image like this. Um, different species of wasps are gonna hunt different critters. So sometimes our, our spider wasps will hunt one spider per wasp larva. We also have um, a species of wasps that will hunt crickets. And so they will provide crickets for their young larva. And then we have other wasps uh, that make their, their nests out of mud uh, and they will hunt soft bodied caterpillars. So each wasp has a different um, critter that it hunts and, and usually they're pest insects. So here's some pictures of the inside of our different solitary wasp nests. So we've got some crickets here, we've got some caterpillars, and then our spiders. Okay, so and I wanna bring this caveat, bee hotels are awesome. Uh, if you come across insect hotels that have these little slits in them like this, don't buy them. Um, they're marketed as butterfly houses, but they don't actually, butterflies are not gonna nest in here. Uh, really, you will only attract European paper wasps, which are one of those two species of nuisance wasps we have. So, and then again, if you have a wasp nest in here, um, you know, if it feels threatened, they might sting. So don't go for the butterfly houses. Instead, plant caterpillar host food. Okay, so this is a foe that I want to talk about, but it's kind of a sensationalized foe, in my opinion. Uh, the Asian giant hornet. This made headlines last summer because a small number of wasps were found in Northeast Washington. Uh, researchers and entomologists are doing their best to eradicate the populations that are there. They found a couple nests and they're, they're, they're making headway. Uh, we don't know yet if there are still individuals out there, uh, but why was this sensationalized and why we don't need to worry about this here in Colorado? 
Um, the name murder hornets, it, it sounds kind of scary. And if you look at it, it's a scary insect. But the, the Asian giant hornet is, actually has a similar life cycle as all the other wasp species. They're opportunistic hunters. So just like the praying mantis or, or other wasps, they're going to hunt a variety of insects. Now, the news also grabbed the attention that this could decimate honeybee colonies. Well, you know, if there was an Asian giant hornet colony nearby a honeybee hive or an apiary, absolutely, you know, that, that's easy prey. Um, but it's important to note that the Asian giant hornet certainly does not target honeybees. Uh, they will target any insect prey that they can find. So is this wasp coming to Colorado? No, you do not have to worry about that at all. Uh, they cannot survive in our climates, first of all. It gets way too cold, it's way too dry. We have high elevations here. They would have to figure out a way to get over the Continental Divide to get here. Um, there's just a lot of obstacles from preventing them from being in Colorado. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, but what I do wanna talk about is some of the wasp species that may look similar to a giant Asian giant hornet here in Colorado. And that is our pigeon tremex. So as scary as the Asian giant hornet is, this wasp, it might look big and scary, but it is harmless. It couldn't sting you if it tried, um, but it is large. And unfortunately last summer, many people killed these wasps out of fear um, of thinking they were the Asian giant hornets. And um, that makes me really sad because this is a native insect that has a role in our ecosystem. Um, and, you know, it may look scary, but this is not a stinger. This um, is something called an ovipositor. This wasp has a, a special function to drill into old dying trees, like cottonwood trees. And she will lay her eggs in those trees. Um, doesn't harm the tree. She already is a, a, you know, laying eggs in a stressed out tree or a dying tree. Um, but she, this uh, ovipositor specialized for drilling into the tree and she cannot sting you. So if you come across one of these next summer, don't be scared. It's not going to hurt you. Um, just let it do its thing and know that, wow, um, I saw an interesting wasp today. <laughs> And then in addition to that, we do have some other large wasp species that are often confused with the Asian giant hornets, but they are certainly not the Asian giant hornets. Um, one of them is the giant Ichneumon wasp, and it's a very large wasp. She also has a very long ovipositor to lay eggs and to drill into trees. Now, the, the giant Ichneumon wasp is actually specialized to parasitize the pigeon tremex. So we just talked about the pigeon tremex. So she lays her eggs in a cottonwood tree and then the giant ichneumon wasp will actually seek out the, the larva in the cottonwood tree, the pigeon tremex, and the giant ichneumon wasp, her larva, will feed on the pigeon tremex larva. So everything's all connected. Um, but again, no need to be afraid. They certainly can't hurt you. Um, and they are common in our backyards. Okay, so this is another friend or foe, you decide. Uh, spiders. Spiders um, can sometimes incite a lot of fear, but spiders provide very important pest control services in our gardens. And so let's talk about a little bit more about spiders. So they provide pest controls. They feed on all kinds of things, aphids, moths, beetles, flies. Uh, and it's estimated, one study estimated that they feed on between 400 and 800 million tons of prey annually. Just spiders, not even the other insects. So very valuable. Are they dangerous? The answer is no. The vast majority of spiders are not dangerous and we do not need to fear them. Now, the one exception that we have are black widow spiders. They do have venom in their bites. So if you were ever to be bit by a, a widow, black widow spider, you would need to seek medical attention. Now, here in Colorado, spiders are often misidentified as the brown recluse spider, uh, when in fact, no. They, I can tell you right now, it is not a brown recluse spider. Uh, brown recluse spiders, if you look at the map in the bottom right-hand corner, 
uh, their native range is not in Colorado at all. So if a brown recluse spider happens to be found in Colorado, it was transferred, you know, via some, some way into Colorado. Um, it did not naturally occur here. So most of the time, um, brown recluse spiders are, they're misidentified. It is another species of spiders. Now, spiders can bite. Um, they don't want to bite. Um, usually spider bites occur if there's accidentally a spider pressed up against your skin. Um, and spider bites can hurt, but the only one that has venom, poisonous venom, that's naturally found in Colorado is the black widow spider. Okay, there's a lot of false information out there on spiders. This is an example um, that Whitney, Dr. Whitney Cranshaw always uses. So this was uh, spread across social media and the news as the hobo spider and, oh, it's killing people right and left, on and on. And false, 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 false information. Um, this is a woodlouse spider that is common. They're in every single home. Uh, and they might look scary and they, they can bite, but they will not hurt you. You know, there's no venom. They certainly are not gonna kill you. Um, they, you know, they're just doing their thing like any other spider. So if you come across information like this, check your sources. And we recommend if you wanna know um, accurate science-based information, when you Google something like spider, um, type in site colon edu. And that's gonna give you university-based resources um, to, to help you separate out the, the fact from fiction. So let's look briefly at some of the spiders we commonly see in our gardens. Um, funnel weaver spiders are, are very common. Um, they're also one of the most common spiders found in homes too. Uh, they tend to create a funnel type web. Um, they look similar to wolf spiders, but they do have slightly different markings. Uh, this spider is also considered a, a hobo spider. Ho don't, don't fall for it. Um, these spiders are harmless and important. Um, important spiders in our garden. We also have jumping spiders. So jumping spiders are often, I think, feared because they have big eyes that you can easily see. Uh, but again, they're, they have those big eyes so they can be excellent hunters and they're gonna hunt other insects in our garden. Um, again, not aggressive at all. Uh, they like to um, be in sheltered areas. So if you lift up a rock, or something, you may come across uh, jumping spiders. Wolf spiders get attention oftentimes because of their size. And they kind of look like funnel weaver spiders, but you can look at the pattern on the abdomen. That can be a good way to identify a wolf spider. Again, um, they, they could bite you, but it's you know not very likely. Uh, and, but they can get kind of large. So be aware of that, um, but, but pretty much harmless. One fun fact about wolf spiders as they carry all their babies, the females carry all their babies on her back. So if you see a spider with a bunch of babies on her back, it's probably a wolf spider. Cat face spiders are another uh, common spider that we often see in our gardens. And actually we talked about the black and yellow mud dauber. Uh, their, fa their favorite prey to hunt are the cat face spiders. Uh, these can vary in size and shapes. Uh, oftentimes in the fall, the females develop a large abdomen and so can be very easily found. Um, but again, a harmless and great creature uh, to have in your garden. Here's the woodlouse, how, the woodlouse hunter that I mentioned before. We all have them in our yard. Um, it's actually not a native spider, um, but very common. And they, they hunt at night. Um, can bite, but they are certainly not aggressive. So real quick, because I, I know this is a common question, if you have spiders in your home, what do you do? Well, if you want to prevent the spiders from entering your home, remove, seal up any cracks or holes in the window screen. You can seal up the areas where they're coming in. That is going to provide you the most control. Um, you know, seal up cracks um, with caulking, that kind of thing. You can also move wood piles and other um, debris around your house that can serve as nesting areas for those spiders. Um, some people may choose to, to use pesticides. That certainly can be an option. Um, 
sometimes it's not the most effective option and it certainly doesn't prevent the spiders from entering your home again. So sealing up your home is the most important. Okay, earwigs, again, friend or foe. Uh, earwigs, they get a bad reputation too. Uh, and they, they can be quite a nuisance, especially in large numbers. But a lot of the folklore, like nest in your ears, that is all false information. And they, they actually are pretty harmless. They don't do much damage to plants. Uh, and they, they feed on aphids and mites and insect eggs. So in some ways, they're definitely beneficial. Um, they are invasive. Um, they are not native to, to Colorado. Um, and they often get blamed for plant damage that eh, usually isn't caused by the earwig. So examples are if you have leaves that are curled for aphids, that is a great hiding place for, for earwigs. They didn't cause the damage though, they're just hiding there. And same with like holes in fruit. Um, they, they don't feed on fruit. Um, they're just looking for those hiding places. So if earwigs are a nuisance for you, a um, couple things you can do you can get um, like layers of cardboard or crumpled up newspaper and put some wheat germ in it and that will attract them. And then you can dispose of the, of the cardboard. Uh, you can also use like a small cup of, of vegetable oil or another type of oil and sink it into the ground and the earwigs will come into that oil and they will drown in the oil. Um, that can be a way to, to reduce numbers. And then if there are, definitely a nuisance. You know, there certainly are some insecticide options available. Um, I recommend looking at our fact sheets for more information on different options. Okay, so now let's talk about foes. I'm going to fly through this quickly uh, because we, we are running low on time, but I do want to touch um, generally, generally garden foes are considered invasive insects. So Japanese beetle and emerald ash borer are great examples. They are invasive, they cause extensive damage, they are not supposed to be here. So those are for sure our, our foes. Before I jump into those two, um, I do wanna mention flea beetles. Flea beetles can be another nuisance or foe in our gardens. Many species and they feed on a variety of our vegetables. Um, they create a shot hole appearance in the leaves, like in the photos, um, and they're most active in the spring and can feed on your, your new vegetable seedlings. So a few things to note about flea beetles, if you've got flea beetles. Um, on established plants, if the damage is less than 30% of the, the leaf area, uh, it's not going to impact the growth or the yield. It's, it's mostly an aesthetic thing. Now that's, um, that does not mean, you know, new seedlings are more susceptible. So if you've got huge flea beetle issues, um, a few options of what you can do, you can plant more seedlings than you need. And when you thin them out, thin out the, the seedlings that have the most flea beetle damage. You can also in some use instances use trap plants. So for instance, you could plant, plant radish and the flea beetles will feed on the radish and then you remove the radish and hopefully that will eliminate some of the damage from your broccoli or your cabbage. Um, you can also add floating row covers or screens to protect your plants uh, or you can remove beetles with sweep nets or a portable vacuum. Um, and if you really have flea beetle issues, there are insecticide options. Um, and with any insecticide, the label is the law. So you have to follow the, the directions explicitly. Um, and especially, you know, if you're applying products to your vegetables, you wanna make sure that you are applying products that are safe um, on the leaves of your vegetables if you want to consume those vegetables. So follow the label, um, label is the law. Okay, and since we are short on time, um, I'm not, I'm actually gonna skip the Japanese beetle section, but I do wanna say on March 31st, from 6 to 8 p.m., Dr. Whitney Cranshaw is gonna do a two hour class on Japanese beetles. He's gonna cover everything. So um, let's skip Japanese beetles today. You can find the registration for that on the, the CSU cohorts blog website. Um, it's gonna be a great class. Um, so actually, yeah, we're gonna skip Japanese beetles. If you do have additional questions, please reach out to uh, your local extension office. Okay, but I do want to touch on emerald ash borer before 
before we wrap up, emerald ash borer uh, is native to China and attacks ash trees in the Fraxinus genus. And so that is going to be our green and white ash trees. Ash trees are a very popular plants or tree in our landscape because they grow well and they are beautiful. And so, so this is a real loss for us. Uh, here in Colorado, it can be up to 20% of ash trees in our urban communities. Our 20, I'm sorry, 20% of all trees in, in our urban communities are ash trees. So we're looking at a huge loss. Um, if you look at the map of how emerald ash or how emerald ash borer got here, uh, this is the the blue line is where EAB was confirmed. Nowhere in the Midwest, and then it hopped over to Boulder County. So this insect hitches a ride in firewood. So all the more reason um, do not travel with fire ash firewood. Um, in case it does have emerald ash borer in it. And so right now here in Colorado, emerald ash borer has been confirmed in Boulder, Larimer, and Adams in Broomfield counties. Um, it's slowing, it's, it's spreading a little bit slower than expected, um, but it is gonna spread, um, especially throughout the Front Range. So we need to all be prepared for it, you know, if emerald ash borer is in your county or if it still needs to arrive in your county. Uh, and emerald ash borer, it's very difficult to detect. So they, they start in the top of the trees and oftentimes they'll infest a tree for a few years before the tree starts to show symptoms. So this is very difficult uh, to detect, but all ash trees are at risk. And many of you I'm sure remember um, Dutch elm disease. So to give you an idea of the, the magnitude that emerald ash borer is gonna have, uh, Dutch elm disease killed about 200 million trees where Ash trees, emerald ash borer could kill about 7.5 billion ash trees uh, in our country. So it's, it's a big deal. Um, the key characteristic is going to be these D-shaped exit holes in your ash tree. Um, otherwise, they, they have the same life cycle as other, other bark beetles um, and other wood borers. So they're going to nest in the tree and the larva feeds on the, the growing layers of the tree and over time that will cut off um, nutrients and water from the rest of the tree. Uh, so the first thing to know in your landscape is if you have an ash tree, so look for, for the five to nine leaflets. Uh, ash trees also have opposite branching, see the opposite there, diamond shaped bark, and some trees will have the, the seeds present on them as well. Um, signs you may have emerald ash borer, they create galleries. Uh, they, uh, if an ash tree is stressed out, they'll shoot out epicormic branching, which is these branches that, that, that are not supposed to be there. Um, ash, ash trees can do that for a lot of different reasons. Emerald ash borer is one. And then the tree may also uh, start showing cracks. So here's those D-shaped exit holes. Now I wanna talk about I'm actually going to, you you may see adults flying too and woodpecker damage and the leaf size, but I want to mention, hold on, I'm going to skip ahead a couple, lilac ash borer. Lilac ash borer creates these round shaped holes about the size of a pencil eraser. This is often confused with emerald ash borer all the time, um, but in fact, they are not nearly as harmful as emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer is a clear wing moth. So it's not even a beetle, it's a moth uh, that looks like a wasp. And they will feed on the tree, but they tend to go to trees that are already stressed out. They usually typically do not kill the trees. So if you've got lilac ash borer, you don't need to treat your tree. Um, the better approach is to figure out how to keep your ash tree as healthy as possible, um, because that will, that will prolong the life of your tree. So I want to show you one more thing. Which of these stressed out ash trees do you think has emerald ash borer? Just in your mind real quick, which one has emerald ash borer? The short answer is none of them. Ash trees have lead very stressed out lives in, in um, urban areas. So the important thing is to look for those D-shaped exit holes and monitor your tree 
um, and, and watch for uh, the news and your extension resources to know when Emerald Ash Borer is spreading. Remember, Emerald Ash Borer and Japanese beetles have a lot of lookalikes, so be very aware of that. Um, ash trees also have little tiny ash bark beetles. They make little pin-shaped holes. This can contribute to limb dieback, but again, it is not gonna kill your tree. Um, so it's not nearly as deadly as emerald ash borer. So what to do now? If you have, you, if you have an ash tree, you need to start planning. Uh, if you have a high value tree, a large tree that's over 15 inches in diameter, and it provides a lot of value to you, uh, you'll wanna consider at some point protecting that tree. Um, protecting it, uh, talk to your local county extension agent on how, how close the infestation is to you, um, and that kind of thing um, before deciding when to treat. Uh, if your tree is already stressed out and not doing so well, it's probably not going to be a good candidate for treatment. So that's good to know um, so you can plan for the eventual removal of that tree. Um, and note that uh, trees that are not sick with EAB are cheaper to remove and then trees that are smaller are also cheaper to remove. There are a lot of great replacement options. Um, your local extension office can help you with replacement ideas. And for now, it's really important to just start considering a plan. And tell your friends and family and neighbors about this too. Okay, so I'm wrapping up now. Um, I know I flew through the last, that last section very quickly. Uh, if you wanna know more information about insects, here's two great websites. Um, the Extension website, we have a lot of different fact sheets uh, on insects, so you can learn the, the pros and the cons, and if they're a nuisance, um, what the control options are. Um, Dr. Whitney Cranshaw also has uh, his insect information website, which has even more information uh, on insects in your garden. So check that out. Um, also, this class will be posted on the CSU cohorts blog if you want to rewatch it or share with your neighbors. And as always, if you have any questions, please contact your local extension office. Okay, any questions? Actually, Lisa, there aren't any unless a few come in. So if you do have questions, we have a couple minutes where you could send those to me. You could send those to Carol. Either of us would be Happy to then relay that information to Lisa. Uh, Lisa, as you went along, we did post fact sheets that you discussed for those specific insects. So do refer to the CSU Extension website. So much information on there. It's overwhelming, we know, uh, but definitely check that out. Um, Joanna does have a question, Lisa. Do you know what insect might eat salvia? Um, it kind of causes a lace-like pattern in the leaves or maybe even Carol might know that. Ooh. Alvia. Um, off the top of my head, I don't, but I will do a little bit of research on that. Salvia. Um, yeah, I don't know off the top of my head, but I can look that up. And I will give Joanna your email address. So maybe okay. if you're not able to find it, Joanna, you could always follow up later this summer if it's something that you see with a photograph. That's always very helpful. And then we know the time of year that it occurs as well. And, and pictures too. And what time of the day are you seeing the damage? Is it when you first go out in the mornings or not? Yeah, as much information as possible is helpful in diagnosing those things. Patty wants to know if a pill bug is a friend or a foe. Mm. Um, pill bugs can cause damage. So they, they could be considered a foe, um, but in, in small numbers and everything, they, they typically are, are pretty harmless. And then one last question from Catherine, what about leaf miners? And I'm assuming she's speaking maybe more of the vegetable garden and some of the spinach leaf miners we see, but any suggestions other than just not planting that crop for a year? Yeah, so leaf miners, let's pull, let's pull that fact sheet up real quick. Unless Carol, if you know off the top of your head, feel free to jump in. So is the question, are they friend or foe? Nope, just what can you do about them? Well, the problem with the leaf miners is they're encased in the leaf uh, protected by the upper and lower leaf surfaces. So the recommendation, if it's in a vegetable garden is that you 
pick and destroy the um, the leaves. And by destroy, I don't mean putting in the compost pile because they'll finish their life cycle in that leaf in the compost pile. Um, and then also uh, rotate, for example, spinach or shard, that sort of thing, to an area of the garden that did not have that plant there the last couple of years and use the floating row cover from the beginning of sowing seeds because the flies emerge um, at the same time as those early crop emergence. Um, now, if it's on trees, I don't know, it's more of an ornamental nuisance. Lisa? Yeah, I just shared the fact sheet um, in, the, uh, in the chat box. So if um, you have a specific plant that you're concerned about, send us an email and, and yeah, that's great, great advice. Thank you, Carol. So thanks everybody for joining us. Please continue to support the Front Range Gardening Series. A big thanks to Lisa for her expert knowledge and also to Carol. And we do hope you have a wonderful weekend.